This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. True Crime Podcast. I'm Sadie Eck. And I'm Courtney Eck. And it's Courtney's night. It is. She's going to do it. I am going to do it. Somebody said recently in a comment that we should say, and we're sisters, because they missed oh, yeah. it when we stopped. And we're we're still sisters. We're still sisters. If you're new to the area, we're sisters. Yeah, we're sisters. Her last name is Eck, spelled E-C-K. Yep. We're not just being clever. Yep. With some weird last name. That's our last name. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just, what else anything else no we need to clear no up before I think we that, get started i think okay. that's enough bookkeeping for the beginning of this episode <laughs> stick around for the end we usually keep all keep all our banter to the back that's another thing you can know if you're new here um and tonight's case is fucking crazy nobody mm. actually dies so well i mean that's a gift yeah that's a big Plus, I mean, minus and for those of you who are total freaks who are just here for dead people, but plus for those of you who are here for crazy stories where nobody actually dies, this is the... I think it's... Huh? Sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's, I think it's nice to take a break from murder sometimes. I do too. Cleanse the palate with the unbelievable case of the goose green stabbing. So there's a little trigger warning for rape and child sexual abuse. So on June 29th, 2003, in an upscale suburb of Manchester... A 16-year-old boy, who we will call Mark, called emergency services to report that a madman in his early 20s, wearing a black hoodie and black jeans, had just attacked his 14-year-old best friend, who we will call John, in an alleyway and stabbed John in the stomach and chest several times. Police immediately put out an all-points bulletin and alerted the media to be on the lookout for the intruder in all black. Quote, this was a seemingly unprovoked attack. The detective chief inspector told the media who were directed to inform the public of the knife-wielding monster, and we have no idea why this happened. John was rushed to the hospital and almost died twice while in surgery because, quote, blood pooled inside the boy's body cavity, and this restricted the movement of his diaphragm, which stopped the functioning of his lungs. For days, he lay on a respirator, treated with painkillers and antibiotics, saying little. But in the end... John survived the attack. Good. Yes. So police launched their investigation to find John's attacker, but quickly realized that his account of the attack didn't make any sense as he told it. He said that the attacker had run off in a direction that quickly ended in a 40-foot drop, so it wasn't a feasible (laughs) way. (laughs) (laughs) Whoops! For someone to escape without seriously injuring themselves or just being a cartoon character. like Yeah, or like flying. <laughs> yeah, wily, wily Coyote. They also reviewed all of the CCTV footage and didn't see a single other person entering the alleyway that night except for John and Mark. Police continued to press John about who had attacked him that night, and he finally admitted that it had been his best friend Mark, the same person who had called for an ambulance who had stabbed and nearly killed him? Was this was this a show? I think like, I'm sure not not that not that this is a show. Was there a show about this? I think there's a documentary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it sounds familiar, but I cannot remember any of the details. I know. Well, same, so. same. When I heard about when I read about this case, I was like, that case is crazy. And then as I went through it, I was like, yep, I've definitely heard this one before. I think yeah. there's a documentary about it that I saw. Yeah. I know there's okay. a documentary about it. I think that's where I saw it too. Right. Quote. Mark did it once, stood up, holding me. He did it again. He was kneeling on me, saying, trust me, holding the knife to my stomach. Uh, Yeah. John was then dragged to his feet, and Mark plunged the knife back in. uh, Quote, call an ambulance, John screamed, I'm dying. Shush, people will hear, please be quiet, the older teenager uh, told him. (laughs) You've killed me, screamed John. Don't say that, begged Mark. Don't let that be the last thing you are saying. So John had a troubled childhood, and when he was four, he learned that the man he thought was his biological father was actually his stepfather. He also learned that his biological father had been physically and sexually abusive, 
and had actually kidnapped John at one point when he was a baby. His stepfather had a terrible drug addiction and eventually abandoned his family, which forced him, his mother, and sister to move into a smaller home and sent his mother into a depression. At age seven, John began self-harming by trying to cut his wrist with a toothpick and was treated terribly at school as well. He was a good student and maintained good grades, but never fit in with other students and was harassed for being gay because the few friends he did have were female. When he was 11, his mother's boyfriend moved in with the family and dominated his mother's attention, which made John feel even more isolated, and so he took solace online, where people gave him positive attention and filled in the lonely gaps in his life. By the time he was 13, he was spending hours online every night after school and began developing characters to play in chat rooms that he knew would get him even more attention than if he was himself. This is my continuation of the catfishing right. series <laughs> that I unknowingly started. And this will also be the conclusion <laughs> of the catfishing series that I unknowingly started. Unless the next episode is also a, I, un, listen. Un, inadvertently <laughs> about catfishing. If I, if I find a story that sounds interesting and it ends up with a catfish in it, I'm sorry. I have no control yeah. over my own choices. <laughs> <laughs> so... John's first character that he developed was Rachel West, who was a charming, beautiful teenage girl, and John chatted with between 20 and 30 online friends every day as Rachel. One of those friends was 16-year-old Mark, who was also a decent student, was very popular, and was good at sports. John was totally enamored with his new friend, who was everything he wanted to be, and Mark fell pretty hard for Rachel, the beautiful teenager he thought he was chatting with. Eventually, John decided to bring his real self into the chat and had Rachel introduce him as her brother, and he and Mark also began chatting as their real selves. So Mark and John became fast friends and had tons in common. They started video calling each other to hang out face to face, and their friendship grew stronger and stronger. A few months later, Mark had fallen in love with Rachel and was persistent in trying to video chat with her or hang out in person, which freaked out John because, well, Rachel didn't exist. So John came up with a plan. John decided to introduce another character into the chats named Kevin. Kevin was apparently a, quote, crazed homosexual stalker who was, quote, obsessed with abducting and sexually assaulting Rachel and John. Oh, God. <laughs> Just That's a dark twist. <laughs> swinging for the fences with that character. <laughs> Kevin only used pink text in the chat rooms, quote, because he was gay. Oh, Lord. Mm -hmm. Leave it to a fucking teenager, teenage boy. Kevin told Mark that he needed him to perform sexual actions on camera or else he would kidnap and harm John and Rachel. Here are some excerpts from the chat logs between Mark and Rachel at that time. Rachel, wank. You're wanking on camera for them? Mark, what else can I do? Rachel, oh my God, why is he making you wank? Mark, because he is gay. Rachel, you don't have to do anything for me. Mark, I do, Rach. I love you. Rachel, I love you too. But despite Mark's commitment to keep wanking to keep his girlfriend and friend safe, Ugh. the crazed homosexual stalker Kevin ended up kidnapping Rachel anyway. <laughs> oh my God. And it didn't end there. Kevin and his made up accomplices proceeded to torture and rape Rachel and then finally brutally murdered her. Jesus Christ. I yeah. mean, I'm laughing because I'm uncomfortable. Well, I do not think this is funny. Well, it's also fake, Sadie. That Rachel was not a real person. I know, <laughs> I know. No, but but he, but he is getting, like he is victimizing. A oh real yes. He's preying on like this boy. Yes. yes. Big time. Big uh, time. And he could have just said Rachel died in a car accident and moved on and yeah, sad and no. mourned. But instead right. he was like, Ooh, I'm gonna invent a crazed homosexual stalker to manipulate you into performing sex acts on camera for right. me and then i'm going to traumatize you by s sending him a message that said quote kicked all her stomach put her head under water then out freezing cold 
and she stained my sheets while she was bleeding. You weren't there for her, however much she screamed for you. Oh, my God. Yeah, That's man. so fucked up. Yes. So Mark was understandably devastated by his girlfriend's murder and traumatized by his perceived role in not protecting her, and his real life began to suffer as a result, because of course it would. And he just never thought to go to the police. No. I mean, there's so many things here that, you know, but he's just, he seems like a very, very vulnerable kid, like very gullible, very gullible kid. And John said multiple times after the fact that like, it was just kind of unbelievable how gullible he was and what he was able to do to him. And he just sort of, I say this later in the episode, but he just kind of couldn't stop himself. He was like addicted to seeing what mark would do for him yeah okay i'm just like making mental notes of other things i need to sit down and tell (sighs) my children it's like (laughs) all i could think about when i was doing this episode seriously so mark's grades started to slip and he became very depressed john of course used mark's grief and vulnerability as a way to get closer to him and to keep mark to himself as much as possible and he created a new persona to help his manipulation So enter Lindsay East, another beautiful young woman who Mark took a liking to. And just after a month of chatting, Lindsay had to be killed off too, as as Mark started expressing some romantic interest in her. This time, Lindsay met her untimely fate when she was attacked and killed by members of the British government. After she was murdered, Mark received an email from her that said that she'd been killed because she tried to protect him and John. (laughs) I don't know what from. So at this point, John decided that it was time for Rachel to come back to life. No, he didn't. He did. She explained rising from the dead to Mark by claiming that she'd not actually died, but she'd just been in a coma. Mm. She also said... That she had gotten pregnant and given birth to Mark's, Mark's baby. Okay. Which is real hard to believe because they'd never met. Never met. met. <laughs> let alone done the acts that are required for pregnancy to occur. Had they met and done the deed, it still would have been highly unlikely that she would have succeeded and carried the baby to term, considering the extent of her injuries she sustained when the crazed homosexual stalker, Kevin, attacked her and left her half dead. Uh, But Mark just rolled with it. Okay, now also, Mm -hmm. sex talk. Like, we need to talk about the sex, about how babies are made. Yes, that you can't get a baby through a chat room. Nope. As hard as you try. So John later said that he did begin to feel conflicted by his actions as the deception grew deeper and deeper, saying that he, quote, both loved and felt trapped by the complex story that he'd created. He was totally consumed by his online life and deceptions and felt more and more isolated from the real world and didn't know how to find his way back to reality, even if he wanted to. One major shift happened around this time, which was that Mark and John started hanging out in person instead of just online. John also realized how much of a young ladies' man Mark was, and he was very jealous of the attention his friend got from girls their age. John also ramped up his commitment to his online deceptions and was spending from 4 p.m. to 7 a.m. every day crafting stories to present to Mark to keep him interested and engaged. Like, imagine if he had a job. (laughs) <laughs> like, that's so much time. I mean, he's a high school student, though. I mean, man, like, remember no, how much no, fucking like, time yes. it took to be a high school student? My God. Yes. Yeah. So in the months leading up to his attack, John said he stopped eating because he was so engrossed in his deceptions and lost a ton of weight. So John managed to wind down Rachel as a main character somehow, and then introduced a new character named Janet Dobinson, who described herself as a, quote, 44-year-old woman who was still very sexy. Oh. <laughs> That's not the most teenage boy thing <laughs> you've ever heard. I guess. <laughs> oh, oh, boy. Janet claimed that she was a mother and secret service agent and that her husband was an awful man who she was desperately trying to leave. While Mark fully accepted previous deceptions, like Rachel coming back from the dead and giving birth to his baby, 
He expressed doubt for the first time with Janet and had a hard time believing that she was actually a Secret Service agent. <laughs> yeah, that's very strange. Like, that's what... I know. It's the, the straw that broke the camel's back. <laughs> the zombie baby mama is fine. Right. But, yeah, no way. Wait a no minute. way you're a spy. So Janet had a deep working knowledge of Mark's daily activities and was able to convince him of her spy abilities by sharing this information with him. Oh, no. John is a f diabolical mastermind. I mean, that kid Seriously. is so fucking smart to know that that, you know, he'd be like, how's your haircut today? And stuff like that. God. Mm -hmm. So he was stalking this boy, going to school, staying up all night, making stories. Yes, he was. Com That's like he was completely obsessed with Mark, completely and utterly, yeah. totally obsessed with Mark. Yes. That's so much stuff to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's dark. So Janet told Mark that he actually lived in a neighborhood that was absolutely packed with spies. <laughs> <laughs> and that his teachers. Spy town. <laughs> yeah, his teachers, Spy bus drivers, and a nearby shopkeeper were all her spy peers. And we laugh, but if you're a 16-year-old boy, you don't know how the world works. Yeah, you know, totally. Maybe she wasn't in a coma, maybe, you know, and you're so excited. Maybe... There are spies. This is a place where all the spies live. How cool, you know? Right. I, well, I think it goes back to that, like, assuming he had a pretty okay childhood where people aren't just constantly lying yep. to him. Good you know, point. He doesn't have any mm -hmm. reason to believe that somebody would just do this to fuck with him. Yeah, especially an adult, especially a 44-year-old right. woman. Yep. So she also said that maybe one day Mark could join them and be an intelligence agent too, and Mark was excited about the potential. So Janet said she'd give Mark a series of tasks to test his potential for joining the ranks of international spies and told him he'd be under surveillance to ensure he carried out all of his instructions. One chat said, quote, four agents watching you now. Janet said that she needed Mark to become the bodyguard of a boy named James Bell, who was very important to the British government. If he succeeded in keeping James Bell safe, he would be given 30,000 pounds. Mark was thrilled by the exciting and dangerous opportunity. Janet then revealed that James Bell was actually the code name for his best friend, John. <laughs> and that John was worth 568 billion pounds. Wow. I know. All of that worth was tied up in a giant gem, which was in a safe at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, and John was the <laughs> only person alive that could access the safe because he was the only person with the safe's combination. Oh, my God. Isn't that a good one? It's not a fucking yes. doozy. I also love the details of, like, 568. You know, like, that's such right. a random number. He would have the intelligence to know that if he just said, you know, 200 billion pounds or so, you know, like, using a round right. number, using a a not a, a not prime number just makes it sound more convincing. Yeah. You know? So in a chat, Janet said, quote, Only he can walk through the door. It will not allow anyone else. Mark said, not even the queen. Janet said, no. <laughs> the bottom of the ocean. The bottom of the Atlantic. So John skipped school one day and Janet told Mark that he needed to go to John's school and tell his teachers that he had an appointment and needed to be excused for the day. <laughs> okay. Love it. I love it. Yes. He's like his going to dress up like a dad? Minions. I know. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. <laughs> So after Mark carried out his duty, the two boys spent the day at Mark's house. And I think that's part of the whole, like, becoming addicted to seeing what he could get this kid to do for him. Right. You know, like, totally. I'm Janet. I need you to go steal s some alcohol for us or what, you know. Right. It's kind of the, the options are unlimited. So John's mom caught wind that he skipped school, which was very concerning for her, considering he'd always been such a good student, and this was the first time she'd heard of Mark. John's mom decided to look at his laptop to understand why John had been spending so much time alone, and then started skipping school and paying less attention to his grades. She found John's chats with Mark, which didn't worry her, but also intercepted Mark's chats with Janet, which caused her great concern. 
Why would her son have anything to do with a high-ranking Secret Service agent who wrote things like, quote, I got the queen out of bed? To which Mark replied, quote, No offense, but what does she do anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Janet didn't respond directly to that question, but instead typed, quote, This is the UK's biggest secret. I can trust you. Would it be possible to look at you while I tell you? She then requested that Mark perform sex acts on video for her. Oh, no. Yeah. John's mother found all of these messages and was horrified. She removed the modem and hid his laptop so he couldn't use it but John quickly figured out the hiding spot and would sneak the equipment out at night to continue his chats without his mother knowing. Call the police. Call Mark's Seriously. mom and dad. Call other people. John's mother did insist on meeting Mark and his parents, and that meeting happened soon after. After John's mom was satisfied that Mark wasn't as terrible an influence as she'd originally thought, Mark went to John's house for a sleepover and John's mom thought that they just spent the night watching videos. So she never suspected that her son was... Nope. A predator. Nope. Nope. Just didn't think of that. Nope. Just thought that he was, like, brushing up against some unsavory characters online. Yeah. You know? Right. I mean, that's what you would assume if you saw, you know, in a chat... It's also 2003, so chats were pretty rudimentary, you know? And I don't right. think it would even begin to, like, cross a mother's mind that that was possible. You could create <laughs> yeah. other profiles. Yeah. And, yeah. I think she just thought that John was in a chat room with this older woman preying on John's friend, Mark. Right. But even still, you at least at the very least call Mark's parents. Maybe she did, you know? Right. I don't know. I don't have that side of the story, but it doesn't seem like it based on what happens next. So so she thinks the boys are watching videos all night, and she was partially right, as they were watching videos all night, but what she didn't know was that the videos were pornographic and that the boys were engaged in some sexual activity with each other. It turned out that the sex acts weren't completely spontaneous, and Janet had actually ordered Mark to engage in oral sex with his friend as a part of his orders. Ugh. Janet wanted John to appear to be gay, she said. <laughs> Mark. She said that Prime Minister Tony Blair had made the order and her security clearance forbid her from telling Mark why. Mark didn't want to carry out the order, but Janet said she would be fired immediately and likely be in danger if he didn't. <sighs> Mark would also receive a large reward if he did, and eventually he agreed. I don't like that. No. So sensing that there was something off about the friendship and that neither of the boys were doing very well, both sense of parents agreed that they wouldn't be allowed to have any more sleepovers with each other. They also forbid the boys from chatting with Janet Dobinson ever again, but their chatting continued regardless of the parents' wishes. <laughs> like you kind of monitor that shit. You yes. Just expect them to stop. You can't just say nuts enough. No boys. more. No. Good yeah. night. Yeah. Here's your computer in your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So in the summer of 2003, John, and I don't, I, you know, in their defense, I really don't think their parents had the slightest clue how the dangerous gravity. the internet was. Yeah. yeah it was bare, brand new baby internet. It just totally. came on the scene. So yeah, they didn't really, I don't think they could grasp what was going to happen then or ever. So in the summer of 2003, John ramped up his deception even further and had Janet reach out to Mark with the most serious order yet. She chatted, quote, could you kill someone close to you? You might be tested on that later on. Mark responded, um, I don't know. I prob would, but I would want to know why. I haven't really thought about it. Janet, well, think please. Mark, yeah, I could. There's my answer. Janet then told Mark that John had a slowly progressing brain tumor <laughs> and that the tumor would kill him. She said that despite having a tumor that would kill him eventually, the British Secret Service needed him dead ASAP. Mark wondered why his death would have to happen immediately if he was going to die from the tumor, and eventually Janet responded, quote, I am now in a position to tell you why, 
and went on to say that it was essentially a mercy killing and that they didn't want John to suffer. She said it was also ramp up Mark's initiation into the Secret Service if he carried out the task, and he would be paid all of the money he was owed for the tasks he'd completed, as well as 80 million additional pounds. She said he'd meet Tony Blair in person to receive an honor, and she also promised to meet up with him afterward to have sex with him, and that was the detail that solidified Mark's commitment to murdering oh, his best friend. <laughs> oh, no. Mark. Everyone, let's not forget that Janet is John. All right. Telling Mark to kill John. Yeah. He convinced his best friend to kill himself. That's pretty no. fucking crazy. A 14-year-old yeah, boy awful. invented multiple characters, spent hours and days and hours manipulating his best friend and ultimately convinced him to kill his own self. It's so crazy. It's so fucking crazy. He did express some reservations and said, quote, ain't it murder when you kill someone? And Janet responded, quote, not in your case. John said that Mark's trusting nature made it very easy to deceive him and drove him to pile on even more lies. He later compared it to doing heroin or feeding a dog. As a final nail in the coffin, John sent Mark a message that said, quote, I got a letter today from my doc when I went in a few weeks ago because I was depressed and shit. I got a brain thingy tumor, but it's big. Ugh. John later said that he decided that he'd wanted to die because his lies had grown so out of control, he knew there was no way he could keep them up forever, and ending the charade would mean losing Mark, and he'd rather die than not have Mark in his life. John did build a way out of his suicide in case he changed his mind, and had Janet tell Mark that 6969 was the quote, abort code, and if he heard those numbers, he had to stop whatever he was doing immediately and not follow through with the planned assassination. But John never used the code. Janet also told Mark that he was to take John to a place called Trafford Center and stab him with a large knife. Quote, it has to be big to stab him and make him bleed to death. She said that he should then wait a few minutes before calling an ambulance. She said that if he carried out the awful task, she was promised a promotion and would rise in the ranks of the Secret Service. Mark agreed to the terms, but seemed more preoccupied with meeting the older woman who he'd become infatuated with. He repeatedly asked when he could see her, and she promised to meet him at the police station afterward where she would be undercover. In the end, there were more than 58,000 lines of conversation between Mark and the various personas John had crafted to spin a web around the object of his affection. That's, that's just so unbelievable. Well, when I'm, listening, when I'm thinking about how, even a teenager, like how could they become convinced to do all these terrible things, you know? And then you hear that there's 58,000 lines of conversation. Like, yeah. that is so much relentless manipulation, you know? Yep. I mean, we see all the time, like, grown adults falling prey to fucking MLMs and cults and shit. Right. <laughs> you know? With less, with less, like, effort. influence. Yeah, and effort. Totally. Mm -hmm. So this John just made it his full-time plus job to make Mark do whatever he wanted him to do. It's just so hard to wrap your mind around. It really is. And that John would ultimately not use it. I mean, Mark's, Mark had a downfall. There's no doubt Mark is like deeply disturbed and traumatized by this experience, but that he would turn it around and kill himself with it. Right. It's just so fucking wild. So a police analyst made the comparison that if the conversations were all printed out on paper, they would reach 46,000 feet and Mount Everest is 29,000 feet. Oh my God. <laughs> Just to give you. Jesus. Yeah. An idea. Wow. Yep. So on the day the attack was scheduled for, the two boys went to Trafford Center and Mark purchased the knife he would use to stab John while they were shopping. And it's like... <laughs> Uh, you're john you both know what's coming which is right. fucking cr so creepy to think about 
You both know it's coming. And you're just having like a boy's day out. And you're watching your best friend buy the knife that he's going to stab you with in a couple of hours. Yeah. It's fucking beyond comprehension. So John asked Mark what the knife was for. And Mark said he planned to give it to his mom as a gift. So at 7 p.m., they entered an alleyway in Goose Green, and Mark turned to John and said, quote, I love you, bro, and then began stabbing the 14-year-old. Janet had instructed Mark to say, I love you, bro, and to be sure he knew he loved him before taking his life. Wow. Isn't that the saddest thing you've ever heard? Yes. I can't believe that Mark really did it. I know. Mark asked John to trust him as he continued to stab him, and John screamed out to call an ambulance while Mark tried to quiet him. After Mark had stabbed John several times, he waited 20 minutes and then called for help as he'd been instructed. It's unbelievable. I know. So as I mentioned earlier, John spent a week in the hospital but recovered from his injuries. At first, he echoed Mark's story of an unknown attacker having been the one who stabbed him, but later admitted that it had been Mark who'd done it. He said that the media attention made him feel good about himself, and he was excited to be known in public as the, quote, guy who got stabbed. Get that kid a big brother, you yeah, know, like something. enroll him in the big brothers, big sisters program, like something yep. that kid yeah. desperately needs the to be loved. Writers. Yes. Club. Yes. Okay. I actually thought about, like, as I was writing this, like the guy who I mentioned before, who was the international drug smuggler. And went to prison for 20 years and then got out and was like, I'm unemployable. And his wife was like, are you fucking crazy? (laughs) Totally. And so he just put out a completely honest ad in the Wall Street Journal. (laughs) It's like, (laughs) hire me. (laughs) Yeah. I smuggled drugs between like four continents for 25 years or whatever. Um, this, This kid reminds me of that. I'm like, if he could put his genius to good and not evil, like imagine what he could fucking accomplish. Hopefully he is. His this is obviously their names aren't John and Mark as I said in the beginning, but so there's no way to follow up on them. But ho- I right. hope to God that he's not just like an evil mastermind and he's found like a positive, right? You know, outlet for his genius because he's clearly brilliant. So Mark was arrested and charged with attempted murder and sent to a juvenile facility. He admitted that he stabbed John because he'd heard voices telling him to kill him, and he didn't mention anything about his training to become a Secret Service agent in the beginning. (laughs) God, he's still waiting for Janet to show up. Exactly. But later he told authorities the truth. So naturally, police didn't believe a word of Mark's story and thought it was an elaborate excuse to get away with the crime, but followed up by confiscating both boys' computers. Imagine their surprise when they found pages and pages of chats corroborating Mark's story that John had invented multiple online personas to draw Mark in close and eventually convince the impressionable young teen to murder him. So police questioned John about the chats and he confessed to having limited awareness of Janet and some of the other characters, but later admitted to only doing so because he knew they had the computers. The characters and plot lines that John had created were so impeccable that initially police believed that they were all individual trolls who had targeted Mark and not the product of the mind of one teenage boy. Wow. That's so crazy. Yes. Yes. So they were like, okay, Mark's story's true. This Janet, who's this Janet person, you know, and why was she targeting him? So he had given them all unique typing styles, backstories, and personalities, and never once broke character when chatting as any of the individuals. (laughs) Which is why he was staying up from 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. Like, I mean, he was like meticulously crafting these characters. So nuts. Hard to believe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a person who works in video production. I can barely like put together one mediocre character for a fucking hgtv video (laughs) right (laughs) no let alone multiple multiple diabolical and like deep rich characters with intense backstories so police set their sights on figuring out who janet dobinson really was and one analyst reviewed all of the chats and realized that all of the characters misspelled one word over and over again and that word was maybe they spelled it my my by M Y B Y E. 
Wow. They followed up by looking into the IP address of Janet's chats and learned that the last login she'd made before John's attempted murder was from John's computer. So police brought John in to question him about their findings, and at that point, he admitted to having been all of the characters on the chats and that he'd been the one to manipulate Mark into carrying out his murder. In all, he'd created 193 email addresses to keep up with all of the fictional <laughs> characters. Sorry. <laughs> You're bringing my flu back from the dead. <laughs> With surprise. I mean, I have four email addresses. That is three email addresses <sighs> too so many. many. That's so many passwords to remember. Good point. Good point. Especially back then. I feel like it was like a 82-step process to get into anything. You know what I mean? <laughs> or you just, like, there was Created no passwords. New ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is not my password for anything, guys. Promise. <laughs> for years, it was DeFranco because my my high school girlfriend set up my first Hotmail account, my first email account, uh -huh. and she gave me the password DeFranco, as in Ani DeFranco. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just used it for years, and like random people would be like, "What's your password?" I'd be like, DeFranco. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I love Anita Franco, don't get me wrong, yeah. but not enough to, like, honor her by using her <laughs> as my pet. You know what I mean? But then, yeah, anyway, you get it. Yeah. No, well, if there was, like, levels of gay, <laughs> that would that would bump you to, like, the top tier. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that's not really the level of gay that I am. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like... Yeah, it's almost in some ways. Yes, I live in a fucking log cabin. I have two dogs that I'm obsessed with. You know, like there are ways that I am that level of gay. But generally speaking, I'm like a different, maybe not level, but just I'm somewhere else on the spectrum. You know, right. of types of gay, not the DeFranco as password type of gay. <laughs> Anyway, so at trial, Mark learned for the first time that it had been his best friend, John, who ordered him to kill him and not a high-ranking secret agent. <laughs> God. Quote, the boy was, no mistaking it, aghast. Oh, never the, crossed his mind. No, no, he, hadn't, he did not know. The beautiful Rachel West, whom he had loved, wooed, and honestly mourned, was John as was Kevin, who revealed in the bloody details of her gang rape and murder. Lindsay East, who had briefly enchanted him and then disappeared without a word of goodbye, was John. Janet Dobinson, who had watched him masturbating on a webcam and who had promised him a lifetime of wealth and glamour, was John. The ice cream vendors and shop assistants engaged in ceaseless surveillance of Mark. All John. The world he had known was John. Written, produced, and directed by john no. quote i've been a fool said mark ah, the heart just aches for him for uh, both yeah. of them you know yes. more so for john but or for sorry mark of course but it's a sad one yeah so john was charged with incitement to murder and perverting the course of justice marking the first time anyone had ever been charged with arranging their own murder God, that's so crazy. 14-year-old boy. Both boys pled guilty, and John was sentenced to three-year supervision order and wasn't allowed to use the internet without supervision. Mark was given a two-year supervision order, and the two boys were forbidden from ever contacting each other ever again. A couple of months after the boys were sentenced, John's mother announced to the court that he had had a, quote, miraculous transformation thanks to his sessions with the therapist. She said that he was happier, was getting along better with her boyfriend, and had a girlfriend of his own. Since John's real name had never been made public, John lied to his girlfriend about the nature of his crime and told her that he'd been stabbed out of revenge when he'd given authorities the identity of a killer on the loose. <laughs> John, stop. <laughs> this time, stop it. I don't think he's had a miraculous transformation, Mom. I'm sorry. No. This, per this time, the person on the other side of his lies didn't believe him. God. John says he's deeply sad that he can't ever see Mark again and very much misses his friend, but understands that their friendship was built on lies, so it wasn't a very good friendship in the first place. There's no way that John's not trying to get, I know. It, like, find his way back to Mark. 
or someone else. I know. John, if you're listening, please become a film producer. Become a film producer. Become a, like, channel it into something brilliant. You are, Seriously. you know, I don't want to, like, glamorize him by calling him brilliant because he's also clearly, you know, is a very lost and damaged young man and a total predator. But he, right. cl- I mean, it's just a fact. Like, it's just a fact that he's brilliant. And it breaks my fucking heart that someone would have that for evil yes Yes. you know like if my 14 year old was like mom i look at all these characters i crafted and i could manipulate this guy i'd be like let's find let's get you into theater right (laughs) (laughs) let's find Uh, a some sort of juvenile writing class for you seriously yeah, my my growing up my best friend since kindergarten we were in kindergarten together and then like we're friends through all like all of school yeah she and i created a, a detective agency and like for the life of me the whole time you've been telling the story <gasps> i've been trying to remember the names of the characters we created it was like chris and like christy or something but uh-huh. it was more clever than that uh-huh. but they were uh it was a boy and a girl and they were sort of romantically involved but not really because mm. they tried to keep it professional but we had a <gasps> very sexual tension Yeah, we had a very detailed list of characters and who would play which character. And we would go to people's mailboxes and steal their junk mail for the newspaper so we could clip out (gasps) uh, the letters to make like ransom notes and shit it I was did not ve- know this really yes oh god it's all we did when i would spend the night over at her house and uh we got very attached to these characters and luckily it was like consensual <laughs> storytelling <laughs> right know, like right make believe play but right yeah we had you know we'd set up the detective agency office and it was very detailed and it just makes me think of that like luckily neither one of us were dangerous predators yep um but how easy it is to kind of fall into that fantasy world, and, world oh yeah. yeah like i would miss the characters when we didn't see each other or whatever it was just really interesting for sure know, that age and, yes yeah and I was a teenager with a deep, 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 deep inner world. I would say I'm an adult with a deep inner world. You know, like yeah. I spend a lot of time in my own mind. And as a kid, you know, now I'm much happier with my actual world. <laughs> but mm-hmm. as a kid, you know, I was pretty bored and isolated and didn't super fit in where I was. And so like any other sort of misfit teenager, I was constantly looking for something else to the point that we would manufacture it you know like my friends and i would sit around and like tell these really hyperbolic stories or like really want ghosts to be real and stuff like that you know so (laughs) totally you know so i can definitely understand from mark's perspective like of course a you have no other reason you have no reason not to the internet's a new thing you know of course like all of a sudden you have access to spies of course you do you know right and so I can definitely understand both sides of the story and how easy it would be for that to, even though it sounds so fucking crazy, how easy it would be to be deceived as a kid, as a teenager. Yep. <sighs> yeah. And the like sexual exploration and, you know, those things are normal to, as long as they're healthy and consensual, those things are normal, but we all went through it kind of right. like figuring out what your feelings were and like you said the sexual tension between the detective characters (laughs) totally (laughs) that's adorable and innocent yeah well we we got in trouble once we were holding hands we were being the characters holding hands like walking through a yard and her dad saw us oh my god he got so mad oh my god Uh... (laughs) she was to try to explain it like no dad no we're, we're character we're detectives and he was just like oh my god no yeah. like oh god forbid my... you'd hold your right best friend's hand at 12 years old Fucking anyway 90s yeah. i swear to god i know i know but yes no i mean i really i can understand it i just yeah poor everybody and john to just have this ability to yep like i wonder what he's been diagnosed with you know, that's yeah. Hopefully, he's not a sociopath. Very good chance he's a sociopath. Right. Best yeah. case, he got fucking treatment, got some medication. Right. Was like, okay, you're brilliant, but you also have this like capacity to slippy slidey around. Yeah. You know, pathological not, not... liar. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. But oh, I hope oh, for the best God. for both of them. I really do. 
So now I have to talk to my children about mm-hmm. how do you become a spy? We're going to start that. How <laughs> how does this happen? <laughs> Would a spy ever come to you as a teenager over the internet and offer you a job if you killed your best friend? No. <laughs> That's not how you become a spy. It's not. No, there's no... I feel like half of the stories we tell about teens, they're getting roped into something by becoming a spy. That doesn't... That's not how this happens. That, it's absolutely true. It's like every yes. catfishing story. And I think it's interesting because it's like, you know how every kid played tea party at the bottom of the pool, right? right. Like we all invented that game. Every catfisher also invented being a spy or a secret agent. <laughs> right. yes. This is like the third story that we've told. Yes. That that's the catfish and gone wrong. Was like, I really think stuff. I might have to just mention it to my children like this. If you want to ever become a spy, this is how it happens. <laughs> no, I mean, especially the oldest. He yes. would be so pumped if he got some spy opportunities. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I was out in my front yard today playing baseball with my children. <laughs> neighbor of ours pulls up in his truck and he is just being a creep and i don't think he meant to be a creep yeah but he was being creep hi what are you guys excited for santa like nobody invited you to this party yeah my, my neighbor like yeah that's a we, very I don't midwestern know who this man pers- thing to do 100 yes. percent. but yep. i don't know who this guy is he and both boys uh well, my youngest, who doesn't really like anybody, was not having it. Yeah. But my oldest was, like, totally into it. It started to approach the truck. Yeah. And I just said, hey, you know, stay here with me. Yeah. Uh, but he was fully willing to go have a conversation 100%. with, like, a total totally. stranger. Totally. Well, Had he been at- like, hey, buddy, you want to be a spy? He would have been like, yes, I do. I want to <laughs> be a spy. Go. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so many things that you don't think that you have to have the conversations with your kids, but you definitely have to have the conversations with your kids. Yep. No Nigerian princes, no spies, no... Can't get somebody pregnant over the internet. Nope. That's an easy one. I mean, well, I guess you have to have a couple of like lead-up conversations, but maybe you yeah. could just lump it all into one, the birds and the bees, all at the same time. Yeah, no. I was just cleaning the the children's playroom and found their... Like, Sex Where do education babies come from book. book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the oldest was real excited. Oh, I've been wanting to look at that one, Mom. <laughs> it, it, there's a part where they talk about puberty, and that's what he's most interested in. Oh, my God. <sighs> yeah, so I think I'm a couple steps ahead. And then I'm going to go buy the book, How Do You Become a Spy? <laughs> <laughs> do you have to masturbate on camera? I was going to say that that God. wouldn't be, but I, you know. Who knows? There's enough weird hazing shit that yeah. maybe that is. So maybe, maybe it is a thing. Right. Do we have any spies the... listening? Is Can you confirm <laughs> or deny that you had to yeah. masturbate on camera to get into oh, the CIA? I hope not. I hope that's not part of the job. I don't know. I don't know at this point. Anything's possible. Seriously. Well, that was crazy. That was a crazy... Yeah, big old pot of crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not crazy. I love that with just any transition, any, we'll just take anything and make it into a transition. <laughs> yes. Tell me what's not crazy. Uh, I have a really special surprise for you. One moment. <gasps> See, you know how I keep saying that we need a jingle <gasps> for names? Yes. I have, I have two for you to choose from. What? I made two jingles. For, you did? I did. <laughs> Are you ready? (laughs) Oh, I was born ready. Okay. Here's the first one. (laughs) It's name time. (laughs) I might trim that. I might trim that one down a little bit. Did you get your marimba out? (laughs) I also just left, like I left in the like snappy breathing. Yes. <laughs> he would cut it out. <laughs> Same time. <laughs> Sounds like Sarah at the end. <laughs> Did you guys like have fancy ladies? Saying, no, this, this is all me. This is all me. God. Okay. This is amazing. There's one more. Here's this. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm gonna pee my pants. (laughs) 
You didn't tell me we were exchanging <laughs> gifts today. <laughs> That's my special, special uh, <laughs> pre-Christmas surprise for oh, all of you. Shit. Oh my god, I'm smiling so <laughs> hard that my jaw hurts. <laughs> Laura, Laura's like, she's like, she's like, Sadie's gonna piss herself. I really almost, I, I'm pissed. sitting kind of funny and. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit, Courtney! <laughs> oh god, these are the oh, things that a forty-four-year-old woman <laughs> does because it's wow. funny. Yeah, that's amazing. And you don't have to pick one. I think we could probably go between <sighs> what both of them, depending I mean, on the season and the. You yeah, know. let's pull our listeners. Which ones do you guys yeah. like? Do you guys have a preference, marimba or? I don't know, monster energy drink is what I would call the second one. We don't have to make everybody listen to them again, but you're going to let me listen to them again before we yes. leave this. I know. I listened to them like 11 oh times God. after I made them. <laughs> Crack wow. myself. That's amazing. Up. <laughs> okay, I really, my my whole jaw hurts. I, I signed up for a free trial for some like online beat, beat maker <laughs> software. It's pretty fucking fun. And it's weirdly like there's uh, like three layers on each of those tracks. I mean, though, wow, man. You I, really know, did it. I know. I <laughs> know. Um, oh, that's so funny. So it is name time. It's Yay. name time. Name time. Uh, Mark C. Zamzow. <laughs> <laughs> did he write that music? <laughs> <laughs> the marimba one was written yeah. by Mark C. Zamzel, who has a low ponytail and wears cargo pants. That's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Dick, Lady Man. What? Yeah, Lady Man. <laughs> oh, God. Um, someone said, from emergency contact list at my school, gay parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they all, though? Yeah. Uh, there's a Hell, Michigan, uh-huh. which one of our listeners was in. And I looked it up. I only live like three hours from Hell, Michigan. So if we Aww. ever need to do some sort of meetup in Hell, we can. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know how to say this fr- first name because it's French, but Honoré de Balzac. <laughs> Honoré, Honoré, I'm assuming. Oh, de Balzac. <laughs> um... Manus McMahon, Manu McManu or Manus McManus from the Irish <laughs> Film Institute. Yes. <laughs> Nancy Hummingbird, a confidential informant. What? Yes, no. she was a confidential informant. Someone sent me in, um, one of the posts from the Vintage Archives. I, we get those a lot. I love when you send those. There was a John Pittman in his lower third said, number one nut man. <laughs> <laughs> There's Shatina Sheets. <laughs> I would pronounce it sh- Shat in your Sheets is what it looks like. Right? Uh, Debbie Weed, and her lower thirds was Mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone lives in Darwin, Australia, and there's a road called Dick Ward Drive that ends in <laughs> Fanny Bay. <laughs> Uh, and I do know that in Australia and New Zealand, a fanny is a vagina. It's not your butt, for those of you who don't know. Uh, in Utah, they have a Dr. Sharon filler up. <laughs> She's a gynecologist. <laughs> no. Uh, the highest peak in Salt Lake City's Mill Creek Canyon is called Gobbler's Knob. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> they said it's a bitch of a hike. It's 10,000 feet. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, there's a tiny town in Alberta, Canada called Beaver Lodge. And there's a salon <laughs> there called the Sheared Beaver. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> they win everything. They do. So Megan Glenn, our co- our frequent collaborator. I thought you were going to say our confidential informant. Our confidential informant, <laughs> Megan Glenn. Who we've known for fucking 15 Ever. years now. Longer. Just laid this one on us like two days ago. She said, when my aunt remarried, her last name became Klaus, but <laughs> extra S, but pronounced like Santa Claus. So her last name became Claus, and her first name is Candy. <laughs> 
She became Candy Claus. <laughs> God. <laughs> what? Candy with a K, too. Candy with a K. <sighs> People win all the time. And that's all. That is all. Oh, that's good. Should I play a song again to end, yes. the, to end it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just never gonna get over that. <laughs> Maybe I can. We can bookend it, and the other one can say, "It's not name time anymore. <laughs> name time's over. Name time's over." <laughs> oh my god, you guys! Uh, well, um, uh, we're taking next week off. Yep. Bye. For the holidays. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, we are still putting out a Patreon episode, though, because yes. you pay us to do that, and you get what you pay for. So you get what you pay for. If you're going to be too sad about it, just go over and give us three dollars, and you can get an episode. That's I right. think you get like a hundred episodes. How many do Almost. we even have any over there now? Like seventy-seven or something Jesus stupid. Jesus Christ! How are we so prolific? <sighs> I don't know. That's it's weird. Amazing. I, know. I know. It's weird and it's amazing. Because we're very good at our job. <laughs> oh my God. Sometimes I can barely stand myself. Uh, before I forget, because I won't. Anyway, uh, I heard on NPR today that they are creating a f- like national 988 mental health yeah, yep, line. Yep. Fucking awesome. So awesome. Fucking awesome. So yeah. Thank That's God. That's good. Great news. I know. I immediately thought have you heard that episode i think there was an invisible choir about it about the the man who was having a fucking schizophrenic break yes on the side of the road oh my god that one is well there was the one that i I, devastating uh this is actually happening yeah did you listen to that one i don't know maybe that's where it was the kid he was like a teen uh broke into neighbor's house Mm-hmm. Or was like walking around the back. Anyway, had a yeah. long history of mental illness, and the neighbors were scared, and they tried to get the mom to. Anyway, just like one thing after the other, and the mm-hmm. police came and shot him. Ugh. That's <laughs> no, 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 no. Nope. Nine eight eight. I don't know when it. I don't know how long it'll take to like make it a switch. Thank from God. The national uh, crisis line. But anyway. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yes. Thank you. So for... awesome. Mm-hmm. They were saying, too, it's not just for, like, um, self-harm sort of stuff. It's all sorts of mental health care that you need if you right. need to talk to somebody. Oh, good. Have... Good. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Wow. That's fantastic. Yep. You don't have to, like, yeah. Google the suicide hotline real fast. Right. Exactly. Great. Yes. That's genius. Yep. Sometimes we do good things, right? Sometimes right. we as a species. Like, That's what really... I thought. I felt like it's, if it can like actually get put together and there's enough resources mm-hmm. to, to be like 911, mm-hmm. that would be amazing. Yeah. It's a very good first start. That's step. amazing. Anyway. Anyway. Oh, uh, no, man. Just come on over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter if you want to. Oh, my God. Sadie's part is to say rate, review, subscribe, but I'm just going to steal it from her because please rate, review, and subscribe. But today, Marg left us a review, and it was just a heart emoji, and it just said Marg under it. <laughs> I took a screenshot from it off Apple, posted on Instagram. <laughs> Marg rules, man. God damn it, Marg. Marg. <laughs> so good. Uh, but no, come on over there. You can also go to our website. They will kill, and you can... Email us at g- gmail.com. <laughs> Just see what happens. Yeah. Just try it. Yeah. See if it gets to us. You could also put they will kill podcast before gmail.com. And what? How does email work? Anyway, you <laughs> put those things together. You'll it will get it'll get to us eventually. Uh, maybe. We'll see. Yeah. No promises. Um, thanks, AJ Bergantz, for our music. Thank you so much. Although, I mean, we might just have to have Courtney recreate our whole theme song. (laughs) (laughs) I even have a dance to it, too. And Laura and I were down in the basement doing it. (laughs) You need to email that. I need to play it for Ryan. (laughs) Okay. Same time. (laughs) Just really. That's all I need for Christmas. 
Oh uh, we'll God. play it for the family after we open our gifts. Yes, <laughs> as yeah. we as we open. Our mom will piss her pants. 100% <laughs> will piss her pants. That lady knows how to laugh better than anybody. Uh, yeah, she will. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, and remember. Um, I saw this great thing on TikTok, of course, because, of course, everything great is on TikTok these days. Um, but it really summed up. So I kind of like, had to leave Portland after it got too shiny and new you know right um it just sort of lost its magic for me and the town i live in now is very kind of grungy and it's starting to catch on as a cool place to be but when i got here nine years ago it very very much was not and i've never really been able to describe why um i have an affinity for places like this and somebody was on tiktok talking about why seattle no longer like holds their heart and he said philip k dick had um a concept that was he called it the trash stratum and he said that magic comes through trash through broken down things and he calls it the trash stratum and i was like oh my god that's exactly it like i find magic through the trash stratum i can't see it i can't access it when it's all shiny and, you know, condos and new and brand and just do, do, do. I don't, it loses its magic for me. Yeah. Isn't that cool? God, that's so cool. Because Portland back in the early 2000s was just remarkable. It was fucking remarkable. It's hard to describe oh, it. It makes me hurt. hurt uh, yeah, it makes me like it. sick to my stomach yeah. as you think about it. But yep, I've never loved anything like I've loved Portland in the early 2000s. Old, old Portland <laughs> oh. is we all call it obnoxiously all the time yep. anyway anyway if you just trash stratum seek out the trash stratum if you want if you need to access some magic because that shit's real That's why my, my life is so magical <laughs> <laughs> full uh, of garbage <laughs> gonna have to rename the podcast the trash stratum or start a whole other podcast called the trash stratum <laughs> anyway oh, you guys we love you. you little it's not garbage can it's garbage cannot how did that we love you we love you see you in the trash we'll see adam you. yep see you in a couple weeks yeah, goodbye, goodbye.